friends, welcome to episode 214 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can, whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. I'm Sarah. And I'm Rob. How we doing, Rob? You know, I'm, I'm pretty good. Pretty yeah. Good. It's beautiful weather outside. You know, it's been a, a, a good week up to this point, for the most part. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, had a nice meal. I'm waiting for the tea here to steep. You know, can't really ask for much more than that. Yeah, no, I think it's all right. I think I'll ask for world peace, though, but it'll take a little time. Right so. on, right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So let's see here. Uh, recent gaming, had my game last weekend. You did. You yes. did. It went very well. Uh, I thought so, yeah. Very narrative. Very narrative game, yeah. Just a, a very talky game. I think there was like four die rolls the entire time. Um, and uh, But I, I really liked that it got a lot of... Um, a lot of plot out into the open, you know. Yeah, and I think uh, everybody's kind of a lot more on the same page about like what the what the meta narrative is and stuff of like that. So, Especially about each other. Yeah, at least from a player to player perspective. Yes, exactly, so, exactly. I think that that helped out a lot. Uh, and the good news is, I as a storyteller actually got some really good insight into some of your characters as well that I kind of didn't have before then. Um, yeah, fa- fantastic mid game ch- mid campaign check. Yes, y- you need those. I think that yes. the truth bombing. You and know? it's it's really it was really good to have this check in too because. Um, you guys are going to be journeying into the uh, Daedric realm of oblivion of uh, Apocrypha. Once again. Once again, but this time kind of on extended stay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's going to be hijinks um, in a foreign dimension. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be interested to see, because you've opened it up to allow players to kind of set their requests in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's going to make it interesting, because it's... Obviously, I know it's not going to be like a dungeon crawl, obviously, where we go thing to thing to thing. So I'm kind of interested from a storyteller's perspective of how you want to put those events together to make it feel like a, I don't know, like a Star Trek romp episode where like everybody has a little thing. But, like, it's not just scene, we walk through door, scene, we walk through door, scene, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like I, a traditional feel, you know. Or... Um, what, I, what I'm what i kind of considering is, like, since we've got about four different players that all kind of want to find something in the infinite arcane library that mm-hmm, is there, mm-hmm. um, that uh, of doing, like, m- four little mini adventures. Okay. You know, think, think of it as essentially four one-shots that all take about two hours apiece. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll probably have to go two game sessions just because I, I know how we are. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe do two, you know, one, one in the first half, one in the second half, and the next game session, one in the first half, one in the second half, and then we're done. See, like, I I, I think if it was me, mm-hmm. I would do it differently. Okay. I would say, like, okay, guys, let's, you know, pool your resources on being able to do this. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's your chips. Yep. Here's how many successes you need. You can evenly separate them in which all will have consequences and we'll go through each one of those. Or you can say this one was a complete success and we worked through it and these were and then you you channel you handle the challenges differently as a group. I don't think those two ideas are mutually exclusive, but I'm, I like the cut of your jibs, sir. Cuz that lets us decide as players how how easy we want a narrative to go and yeah. then where we want a challenge and then you could be like, "Okay, Let's talk about how this was challenging. Okay. And then okay. you could do, like, a card system for that or whatever to create, okay, the challenge was, you know, was the challenge at the opening? No, it was at the middle. Okay, so you guys got to the books you needed, but then something happened. What was that thing? And that way we're not doing all the little details mm-hmm, of it, mm-hmm. but we're making decisions on the narrative scale. Yeah, and okay, okay. if we have successes, that opens opportunities I am going to give that some really good thought, and we're going to have a larger discussion about that off see, the mics. See, this is what happens when two DMs sit down oh, and have discussions. It's when, it's Welcome when, to the conclave, everyone. It's, and... <laughs> it's when you get when you get super deep into uh, and, and enthusiastic about Blades in the Dark, and then you're like, "Here's how you can better your Savage Worlds game Dude, with those concepts." <laughs> I I had such an eye opening experience in the last, I would say, two weeks. Uh huh. Of really wanting to do non-combat stuff. Yeah. And and just flip the script for me completely. Mm-hmm. And I've got this, like, I'm going to do an in-between mm-hmm. pretty darn soon here. Where it's basically just going to be one-shots, like a series of one-shots, mm-hmm. that are all going to be kind of t- tiny tavernish. 
Okay, okay, okay. Uh, like a like a feeling of that. I might even grab the tiny tavern rules to do it. Sure. Um. Uh. Just because I I don't know them well enough, but I know what I want feeling wise. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But like, yeah, I just I want to kind of do a slice of life fun thing, and let whoever shows up. You know, we the this is the city. Let's fill in the blanks. You know, I give you kind of a Mad Libs type thing for the mm-hmm. group to do, and then. The event happens, like, just like at any good sitcom, it opens with, you know, the do- the door bursting open, and it's Maggie the baker, and she's just like, Mom's coming to town two weeks early. We have to do the wedding tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And, like, that's that's the event. Yeah. Yet there are all kinds of things that are already in play. And then know? hijinks ensue. Of yeah. course. And that's... That's it. Yeah. That's all it, right. you know. All right. And it, I figured those kind of things would be a little different, you know, mm-hmm. something fun, you know, and people could bring whatever they wanted to the table. It'd kind be of refreshing. Thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've both we've both talked about how, like, I'm I'm kind of doing the big epic campaign. Mine started in 2018 and it's yeah. still going. I mean, we yeah. only played maybe 10 times a year, but still, like, well, we just finished the session 35. So since yes. 2018, I we got into the session 35 of this. Yes. And we're most of the way through Act Two, and it's going to be a big three act thing. Honestly, that's great movement. Yeah, that's that's great movement. Because I'll look at you and say this: How many episodes were in Critical Role? Uh, a hundred and fifty, basically. Right. Yeah. How many acts? Oh God. Right. Yeah. And they're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> they don't really have acts. They more have arcs. I right. Mean, well, I, it's it's a feeling. Mine's you know? a little more unique in that I am doing like you know kind of discrete ends of the story. But no, uh, that's that's good, and yeah. that that takes a lot of effort to do, without a doubt. So we have a show that is feeling when you first start when you first start looking at this like a repeat. Yeah. Because and and really what it came down to for me was I saw a lot of interest in the discussion in the live chat and I wanted to give people the opportunity to kind of have a step away from the academic and into the practical. Mm-hmm. You know, we we talk a good game during our two oh twos about how things should be done and we give some examples. We definitely do. But when you're on the fly with it, you need those you need to see what that feels like. Mm-hmm. Right. Now there's an advantage to this one uh, in that I actually asked our Discord uh, members to give us characters yeah. for these character-centric plots. So we have a bunch. I was excited um, about that. I, yeah. I think they're fantastic. I, I, If we get through all of them, it'll be great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have like a lightning round at the end kind of where I haven't told you my idea. Mm-hmm. It's, it's in here now, but you haven't scrolled down, hopefully. I haven't scrolled down yet. No, um, no it's I've, and, I've been keeping, uh, keeping my eyes off. And that's it. just something I wrote, wrote off the cuff. Uh, mm-hmm. That I would want to, to to kind of challenge you with, and I'm not saying challenge in the like the oh this is a hard one, but more in the lines of like you ain't never heard this. Yeah, sure. So sure. Uh, but I I feel like we needed to give this another go so people had it because I think character centric plots are often misinterpreted and run the same risks that normal plots do. Um, that you that it isn't a di- there isn't a great difference there but there are there is a focus on how it gets designed yeah yeah and how it forms i, I think i think typically you know uh, to kind of recap some things that we talked about and this is back from episode 200 mm-hmm. uh, if you're keeping count here um we talked about character centric plots um i think a lot of times when we think of like you know what is this character's plot a lot of times we kind of reach for just the trope of like oh well they they wrote something in their backstory so like the person who killed their father is now the big bad evil guy or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's that's the character centric plot. Sure, and like sure. and okay, I mean that that is a character it's it's a plot that is attached to a character, but when we're talking about this, we're talking a lot more about like what is the internal moral struggle, you know, mm-hmm. of of this particular character and right. essentially um throwing, you know, uh speed grow fertilizer on their uh on their character development yeah you know yeah uh posing you know some real direct very difficult questions for them to have to answer and make some difficult choices about who they are as people yeah and it's it is unlike a normal plot where oftentimes they can skate through it unscathed Mm -hmm. you know they're just existing within the plot and learning about it and moving through it this one uh character centric plots are meant to shave or add to players Mm -hmm. you know it is like you very clearly uh, state and i love this it is external forces demanding external uh and external output so that the player is directly 
causing the results of the plot. Yep. yep. You know, this is not something that they can just be like, oh, I'm not interested in this. If they're not interested in it, then it's it dies. Mm-hmm. Like, it literally just like, it f- fades away. And I, 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 I dare say that if you do these plots right, mm-hmm. they can't be not interested in them. Correct. Um. Especially because uh, you can really do these subtle enough that they don't even notice. It's like you don't really even have to hook them. Mm-hmm. You just make it a thing that's happening. Yeah. And they're just like, okay, I mean, I, whether I'm interested in this or not, it's occurring in the same room as me. You know? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And, it's you know, some people say it's as bold as like, I like the color green and that's green. So now I'm interested in that green thing. Like, oh, you made this thing green to make me interested in it five episodes later. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. And while it was green, I also challenged your conception because actually it's blue. <laughs> right, right. And not only that, but have you noticed that everything has fought that, that's fought you for the last 12 game sessions has been red? Yeah. Hmm. How are we feeling about this? Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is it is the proverbial angel and demons yep. that you want. That you want in many ways, a binary decision Mm -hmm. in the process. You don't need it to be a large conceptual question, but you want, if you can make it binary, it makes it much easier for you as a storyteller to watch the flow and to put things in the right perspective. Yeah. It's, it's kind of the, uh, the, you know, the the trolley problem sort of stuff, you know, you want to, you want to give them the, the two crappy choices, you know, Mm -hmm. and just see which ones they pick. And, and ultimately, um, you know, when when you're doing this, you 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 kind of do it without um, without attachment to the because the goal is the character development. The goal is to make mm-hmm. them make a choice, not to get a particular choice, and that's where it differs from a lot of other plots. Yeah, if you, you know? if you're looking at this with your mind frame of where it's going <coughs> to end up, you're done. Yeah, you don't want that. You want something that is that is literally breadcrumbed until it is grabbed once it is grabbed you're literally just setting forks for them to make decisions on and then reminders of what they've done yeah mirrors and forks yeah exactly so like step one um you want to talk to your players about this 100 percent. 100 percent. find out what your players want mm-hmm. what they're looking for in their story ask them very pointed questions of like hey how did your character feel about this npc how did you feel when X, Y, or Z event happened? Yeah, note, you know? note in what Sarah's saying there that you're not doing this at session zero or session one. Yeah, no, this is like this is I, a few it, in. It's, it's after session, between session seven and eight on a weekend when Rob and I are having coffee, and I'm yeah. like, hey, uh, just since we have a moment, yeah. let me ask you about your character. You know, mm-hmm. you said this last game, and it you know got me thinking. How did you know what what exactly is your your greater thoughts on this? You mm-hmm. know, and let them go, and let them go, and and just just find this stuff out. Um, most players love talking about their characters dead at honest. some level, and the more you know about the character, the more insight you can have to um, see. I'm going to say the more insight you have to screw with them. <laughs> but I, mean, that's but not I the don't truth. but I don't want that to be the impression I no, you know it's take take it to the other extreme where it's just like when you go into a physical therapist mm-hmm. their whole job there is to get you back and mobile. Yeah. Sometimes that's what it is cuz I hate to say it most people bring broken characters to the table. Sure. Like their character is broken in some way multiple times often. Mm-hmm. You know, and really what you're doing as the storyteller is you're helping that character get mobile again by their desires. Mm-hmm. Whether that's positive or negative is completely irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. And that's the way you want to look at it. You're not fucking with them, you're guiding them. You're both both of you are working together to make an interesting plot out of Indeed. it. Indeed. So so the more the more you can talk to your players about this and stuff like that, the better your your kind of psychological deep dive will be about them. Um, and you know, just just bear in mind that not every player is going to be going to want this. No, 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 no. Um, case in point, your wife mm-hmm. uh, at my table straight up did not want this. Did not want a big psychological deep dive of her character. Does nope. not the type of inter- gameplay she's interested in Mm-mm. whatsoever. So I was like, okay, your personal plot is we're gonna have you punch some Khajiit. Yeah. And she's like, awesome. Yeah. Sounds great. And and I will say this. You don't necessarily have to go on a psychological deep dive for mm-hmm. a character-centric plot. What you can do is something as simple as if your character, if the player doesn't want a deep dive, give them something that they're interested in to give them drive. Even if it's as simple as my character loves horses. Yeah. Great. There'll be a lot of them. 
and you're going to be very interested in them. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it starts out as something simple and then the horse that the person's riding in on happens to be a breed of the riders of Rohan and they recognize it 30 episodes later mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, you've taken amazing care of this. Like, yeah. you know, you're like us. And do you want to join? You're like, you step that realm and now they have the question of like, okay. You know, is this where I want to go with my life? It's it's again, it's that helping hand out of the broken mm -hmm. and and where you can end up. And I love I love being able to do that just as equally. So our uh, real quick and again, Alex, like we we went over this in a deep dive and in, in episode yeah, we're just trying to so we're, trying we're to just glance trying to this. kind of like re rehash some of the some of the major bullet points here for you guys before we kind of go into our workshop area. Yeah. Um, so the first, the first step to doing this, other than talking to your players, talking to your players, mm -hmm. always step 100%. one and fi figuring out if this is something you want to do with them. Um, you want to identify the struggle in that character. Yep. Okay. Um, people are beings of contradictions. <laughs> Find one and exploit it. Yes. Okay. Um, do you say you want peace, but you always solve things with violence? Mm -hmm. Do you say you want a quiet life, but you always skip opportunities to retire in lieu of more action? Mm -hmm. uh, do you accept everyone uh, in spite of the differences, but still hold prejudices in your heart? You know, yeah. things like that. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, uh, if they've got a stated goal, this is another one, mm -hmm. um, is find out how far they're willing to go to reach it. Yeah, I want power. I want to be a powerful mage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Find the thing that stops them from being the powerful mage and pit those two things against each other. Right. And see where it goes. And yeah. we'll we'll show you examples of that in a moment. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll walk actually through a few of those. Okay. Two, find or make forces that pit those two things against each other. Okay. Yep. Um, make both of them demand the character's attention. Yeah, it's not something they can avoid. Right. Um, and the thing is to make both choices attractive. Mm hmm Or equally crappy. Yeah. Um, like I said, this is this is essentially putting trolley problems in front of your players. And they don't need to be huge earth shattering things. They don't all need to be gigantic critical moments. Nope. It's I kind of liken it to um Rorschach tests. Mm hmm You know? Mm hmm Where sometimes like, a Rorschach test is not difficult. Those are those ink blot tests yep. that psychiatrists will use where they'll hold up, hold up a picture and it's just a random ink blot of, like, mm -hmm. usually they put a bunch of paper, like, random spots of ink. Mm -hmm. They fold the paper in half mm -hmm. and it makes a weird design and they hold it up to you and they say, what do you see? Mm -hmm. All it's meant to do is kind of get the, your, your, your surface level associations. Mm -hmm. And what that's supposed to do is basically just pick your surface thoughts. What are the things that mm -hmm. immediately spring to mind when, when somebody asks you a question to kind of see where your preconceived notions are to kind of see where you're, you know, what's, what's floating around the top of your consciousness. Yep. These are kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, these don't have to be epic, you know, focus moments. Sometimes it's just as simple of, Hey, uh, this person said this, but this other person said this. Oh, Okay, well, I don't like that other person, so I'm going to agree with the you know the, the first person. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. interesting. We That's just it. we just saw a prejudice of yours. Yeah, doesn't you change know? anything major. Nothing obvious. But you made a choice. Mm -hmm. But you made a choice between two things that were in some way related to your character and pulling you in opposite directions. Yep. And you just keep doing this. Mm -hmm. Just keep putting those into the plot, putting those moments into the plot. And then later on, it can start becoming kind of obvious of like, why does it seem like every single time I have to choose between person A and person B? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's because you said you loved both of them. Yeah. But you can only choose one. Yeah. And on occasion, throw a mirror up by yep. someone they trust. Have someone tell them that's what they're doing. Yeah. It's the best at the end when you can get a villain, like, to look at them and say, we are not unalike. Uh-huh. And they can't disagree because they have all of the ammo they're waiting. You know, they're like, I saw you do this. You know, people of re of your renown has spoken about it. Yep. How does that make you any different than me? Yep. You know? Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, just uh, reinforce that choice throughout the story. Constantly putting this up in front of them. Have others contradict, uh, uh, point out the contradiction directly. Um, and there you go. Mm -hmm. That's that's just it. It's the, you just, you put the, put it in front of them. Keep putting it in front of them, have people point it out to them, and it becomes a very obvious theme. 
All right. All right. Sample characters. We are workshopping. Now, for mm-hmm. those of you on the Discord, you can jump into the questions channel and read these along with us, except for the ones that we're going to add at the end. Um, and that way you can kind of get a feel for where the stuff is coming from. Also, big shout out to Nevin and Overwatch. Thank you so much for contributing yeah. these characters for us to workshop here on, <laughs> on, uh, on the show with you. We appreciate it. All right, so the first one Nevin throws out there. Um, here's a quick description of the setting. Uh, Europe, start of the 20th century. Okay. Magic exists, but mm-hmm. it's secret. Sure. And only a few secret societies know about it. Okay. The character is a wealthy woman. Mm-hmm. She is single by choice. Mm-hmm. She doesn't yet know the existence of the magic world. Her wealth comes from her family and some underground activity. Okay. To keep her independence, she wants to become some kind of mafia boss. Her assets are her social skills, her knowledge of high society, and her wealth. Okay. So, when I when I hear about this, I don't. I'm not going to focus on so much the world setting, although it's it could be a little important here. I don't think it's nearly as important as the words that are, are the the framing that is used. Mm-hmm. And I I, you, I looked at the words directly, and that's what jumped out at me. Is the first thing I looked at was the fact that we had somebody who wanted who wants independence, mm-hmm. and yet they have a family, and that's where their wealth comes from. Yes. So you have someone who wants to be in the who wants to do a mafia situation. Mm-hmm. To become independent of their existing wealth. Mm-hmm. And that right there, those, to me, the first thing I hear is mafia is family. Yeah. The wealth is family, but they're very different. One is controlling, clearly, they want independence from it. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think of, like, this person's a Kennedy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The name Kennedy carries with them. They go to the grocery store. They're a Kennedy. They go to, you know, Capitol Hill. They're a Kennedy. Like, that's what's carried them through life. And for some reason, they don't want that. They want their own name. They want their first name to be the name that carries them through. Their, their Don name, if mm-hmm. you will. You know, but in that, they're now moving to a different family. How are they going to treat that family? How are they going to treat their old family? Because is their old family bad people? Is mm-hmm. all of them somebody they want to cut out? Maybe some want to go with them. So there's a lot of opportunities there to set up motions with NPCs from both their bloodline as well as who they're learning to trust on the mafia side to become their right-hand person, their trusted ally. Mm-hmm. You know, And now you've got these energies that can be A or B, A or B. Two forces that can equally pull on them because exactly. of their desires. Yeah. All, all based around one thing, wealth. What yep. are you willing to keep? What are you willing to lose? Yep. Uh, that's actually a really good dichotomy. Um, e- even even just be, uh, between all the things you defined there, but yeah. just on the more generic sense, you've got a dichotomy of where did you come from and where did you go? Yeah. What is your character, Cotton Eye Joe? Yeah, fair, fair. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> that is... That is fair. That is uh, but fair. yeah, you've you've got your past and your potential future yeah. fighting for control over you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and what does the outside world look like to that? Mm-hmm. Like, who is the foil on the mafia family side who's just like, you don't have any control here. You're just constantly pouring daddy's money into all this. Yeah, exactly. You're just a waste. Whereas on the other side, they're like, why are you foolishly running around in these shadows? Mm-hmm. Just run the business and do what our family has done for the last four generations. Exactly. All you have to do is literally nothing and you inherit everything. Yeah. <laughs> but instead, you're, you you're foolish off girl. Foolish little trifles. Exactly. Of, yeah. Yeah. Trying yeah. to play slumlord, you know? Yeah. I, and I, I love all of that. And it sits in my head, but again, I have no idea where it's going to go. Yeah. It's just an energy that sits there and decisions. And the biggest focus for me is, and this would be the question I would put in front of me for this character, and that is, what does family mean in quotes? Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know? And that that's how I would look at it. Uh, so for me, I instantly go to Don Corleone. Uh, okay. Uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, uh, in um, the, the Godfather. Classic Godfather. Okay, yeah. uh, so we're talking Al Pacino's character in The Godfather. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I realize this is a it is a famous movie, but it is an older movie, so a lot of our crowd probably has not uh, probably has not seen it. Um, it. Is one of my favorite movies in the whole world because it is an entire movie full of character development, mm-hmm. um, and uh, it, it's just brilliant. Um, at the beginning of the movie, our protagonist um, is. Uh, Sitting at the table with his girlfriend at a wedding, mm-hmm. um, the same wedding where you know you come to me on the day of my daughter's yep, yep. wedding, um, 
And he's explaining to uh, his girlfriend, Kate, that, like, yes, they are a mafia family, but, like, he's not part of it. He yeah. doesn't he doesn't get involved in the business and is, and he's correct. And his family respects that. Like there's, there's a point shortly thereafter in that, in that scene where um, they are discussing some quote unquote family business. And they're like, Michael, you, you may want to step outside. We're going to talk business now. Yeah. It's respectful. Yeah. Because we respect, okay. You're, I mean, you're blood, but you're not part of the business. So you step outside, you have your plausible deniability. We'll Mm -hmm. talk about who we're going to kill. And you know, you go on with your life. Happy. Um, there's a mob hit then where, uh, Marlon Brando's character, his father is, uh, is, is shot, put in the critically wounded in the hospital and Michael Corleone needs to start making some difficult choices of what Mm -hmm. he will do to defend. See, it's not, he doesn't get into it because it's mafia stuff. He gets into it because someone shot his father. Right. It's a family obligation. And so his ruthless side is brought out. Yep. And then suddenly... What we have is a series of lines, mm-hmm. okay? And the question is constantly asked of Michael, how far will you go to take control of this situation to ensure that your family isn't harmed by these other mafia families ever mm-hmm. again? Yep. And the movie keeps drawing new lines as Michael marches over them. Yep. I could I can see where you would take that with this one very comfortably. Because, again, it does sit within the realm of the family, mm-hmm. but it asks the question... What are you willing to do for family? Exactly. And that is why the second place my brain goes is Breaking Bad. Okay. No, I think that's a, that's that, that's also very valid. Very early on in the series, um, when Jesse and Walter get their, their meth business up and kind of running, mm-hmm. they realize that they have to – they have some distribution problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And after going through a couple distributors that end disastrously, they decide they're just going to distribute it themselves. Yep. And then someone hits one of their drug dealers. Mm -hmm. And Walter basically says, well, we've got to respond to this. Mm -hmm. And Jesse's like, what, we're just going to kill somebody? And he's like, well, yeah, we have to. Mm -hmm. And in a way, he's right. And it's a moment where this ex-chemistry professor and a high school dropout junkie realize that they now need to murder somebody. Yeah. Because if they don't, they know the reality is that they're just going to get picked off by, you know... Somebody bigger. They're just going to get bullied for the entire rest of their lives. Um, And so they have to make a hard decision about what are we going to do about this. And the answer is murder. Mm -hmm. And that is a line they are forced to cross. Yeah. Okay? So for me, for this character, you want to be a Mafia Don? Okay. That's fine. That's an asp... That's That's a good goal to aspire for. That gives your character a direction. It gives them a trajectory. How far are you willing to go for it? Yeah. What are you willing to do? Yeah. And did you consider the realities of everything that means? Mm-hmm. Your social, you have, your your assets are, as listed by Nevum, social skills, mm-hmm. knowledge of high society, and wealth. Mm-hmm. Those things only get you so far, and they don't wash the blood off of your hands. They sure as heck don't. I think it was pretty good. I like that. I I I I think we we've set that one in a right direction. Yeah. To to give it good. And again, all this stuff is is we're not saying where it ends. Mhm. We're just light yeah. we're just painting little marks in our books to to be able to I, do I this. I have no idea what the trajectory of that character would be. Mhm. But I figure it's going to be one of two things. You're going to draw a line and you're going to be you're going to watch her like Michael Corleone march over each of them faster than you can draw them for her Mm -hmm. and she will become the most evil character in the world or she will hit a point to which she goes okay this far no further well not only that she gets evil but also that other people see the power and now her fam like maybe younger other members of the family come to join her side Mm -hmm. and do things they would have never done because she does them yep yep or maybe she's where the real power lies, and the wealth of her family no longer holds the same sway it did. Yep. All right, all right, all right. Enough. Next character. Yes. Uh, another character, this this is a setting, is a classic fantasy, D&D and the like. The character is an orphan, raised by a different species. He feels he doesn't belong and uh, and leaves to adventure the world. He's witty. He's a skilled swordsman. Yet... On his first monster encounter, he freezes and can hardly fight back. Luckily, someone arrives to help him, 
They quickly become friends and go on their adventures. Mm -hmm. All right. So what I'm seeing with this character is a common theme of a lacking of independence. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got a character that is an orphan mm -hmm. raised by a different species. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, feels he doesn't belong. Okay, so already he's got a group of people, and he's trying to find his independence, and that's why he doesn't belong, maybe, you know? I mean, obviously, because he's an orphan, and he's, he's raised by a different species here, so it's, it's, there is definitely that, that barrier between them. Sure. But he has to find out who he is, all right? First monster encounter goes up there and freezes up. What this says is that his first vent foray into independence failed. Yeah. He could not execute the thing that he was trying to do on his own. Somebody came around and helped him. They become friends. They go on their adventure together. But while they're together as an adventuring pair, half of what he does is essentially owed to this new friend of his. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who, who is he without someone else to define him at this yep. point? Yep. The only ever time he's been alone, he failed. And... The the key isn't to put him alone again. Mm -hmm. The key is to put him alone in the mind frame yes. of people questioning why he's with this other person. Either questioning why he's with this other person, maybe the other person even encourages him to, yeah. to you know, uh, try things by himself or mm -hmm. something like that. Maybe there's a discussion to be had between those two characters about about the the, the, the concept of independence. Yeah. You know, of of maybe this character resents that he leans on him, or maybe he sees that he's timid and encourages him to seize his own power. Sure. Or, I mean, there's a million ways you could take it, depending on the dynamic between these two characters. 100%. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think independence is the place we'd put the screws to this character, and we'd start asking him some questions about who he is by himself, and how does he define himself by his relationships to others around him. Okay. Okay, so I... I like it. I like it. Um, for me, I looked at this and said it's an orphan raised by a different species, couldn't execute, but then was picked up, mm -hmm. right, and, and, and carried into things. Something in this triggered a little bit more of a, like, hidden truth kind okay. of thing going on here. Like, what really happened at the inception point to cause that orphan, mm -hmm. right? And to cause the other thing. Like, there's no knowledge of that there, and, and maybe that player doesn't know fully the truth behind it. Mm -hmm. And in that, you could have that every, you know, they're constantly, you know, not necessarily rebelling, but connecting with other orphans, other individuals, continually presenting them outsiders. Okay. People who are who are just like them, right? That individual. You know, be it a a person who's you know a a, a, a vagabond kid, you know, mm -hmm. or an, an an older fighter who isn't allowed to go on things. You know, giving little assistance here and there, and showing them through themselves that they don't have to feel alone in what they're doing, but constantly putting that mirror back on them that they need help. Right. Mm -hmm. The question then being is is that do you then break it to them that Perhaps the reason why they're an orphan is because of something that they were meant to be. Like, they were taken out. They were the child of the enemy, right? Mm -hmm. And they were orphaned as a child, you know, because they were left to die, effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of a thing. They were too, or, or worse yet, they were too weak to join that strength brood, you know, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you now have that, that other aspect of it is that they could have been something greater had they not had that not been taken from them. Hmm. And so now, you know, now they're being presented back with that, well, you belong with us. Your blood is strong like ours. That's why these people need you. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. you stay with them, or do you start following this new path? Which is more important, the destiny that uh, that you were purported to have or the uh, the future you forge for yourself? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. But again, it's a it's a very positive build up of them getting to know these people and making decisions and helping these underdogs just like themselves, only to find out that they're not an underdog. Uh huh. That the whole reason why they even survived that first monster attack was because of who they were. Yep. Right. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Now, 
full disclosure, from from here on, I haven't read any of these because I was just I was busy at work and I was busy. Fantastic. Before I got over here, so these are all blind to me from here on out. Awesome. All right, so let's try a cyberpunk setting. Okay. The character has been laid off by one big mega corporation. All his friends and family are still part of the mega corp. Uh, and they are living in one of those mega buildings owned by the corporation. So they're called arcologies. Yes. 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 Uh, the character is good at hacking system and dealing with cyberspace. Before being thrown out of the corporation, he has been able to save in a hideout some personal belongings, a deer, cat, or dog, mm-hmm. and as a revenge, manage. Uh, manage. Oh, sorry. To... As as revenge, manage to snatch a symbolic object from the corporation. Well, now he still needs to find some money to continue living. Okay. Well, the obvious challenge on set is money there, clearly. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't give us... Money is a drive. It always feels like a drive. The question is, is that this person was thrown out. Do they want back in? Mm -hmm. What was... You know, where, where is the... Where is the uh, the, uh, desire to return? Because obviously they took something with them. They call it revenge. Revenge is taking something that's valuable and doing something with it versus just putting on your mantle. Is it revenge or is it a keepsake? You're darn right. Yep. Yep. Does it does it does it represent harm or does it represent uh, safety and security? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's those those are the kinds of micro plots mm-hmm. that are less of a plot and more of a constant question. Yeah. And, and but, but that, honestly, like that's that's exactly what I would do with it. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I would do with it. The the obvious dichotomy we can pull on here yep. is the safety and security and surety of the megacorp. And what's what's even juicier about this is that he's the only one that's been excised. Yeah. All of his family is still, in, still inside. Yeah, so you're okay. not sure what happened there either. Exactly. And it doesn't really even matter. Um, and then, you know, so I mean, definitely we would, we would set up some runs against this particular corporation. See, I wouldn't do that at all. Mm. I would do the opposite. If they want to run against it, that's fine. But there's no repercussions that ever come from that megacorp. It's nothing negative. They're bad. Don't get me wrong. But oh no 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 no. Hear me out. Oh though. okay okay. Hear okay. me out though. Okay, we definitely run against this corporation. Sure. Right. So first off, just running against the corporation already implies the question: Are you willing to hurt your old employer? Okay. Or family, okay? quote unquote. Because, yeah. like I said, one of the big questions is: Is this a comfort or is this a revenge? Right. Exactly. Well, we can answer that question. Go punch them. Yeah. Oh, you're not willing to punch them? Okay. I think I know what your keepsake is then. You yeah. know, it's, you didn't, you didn't take it for revenge at all. You took it because you missed the place. Well, see, in okay. my, but, keep going, I'm sorry. But secondly, secondly, secondly though, okay, have someone offer to let him back in. Yeah. Especially after he gets comfortable and established out in the real world. 100%. Get him, get him some friends, get him some power, some influences, and then have someone say, hey, you know what? We messed up. You you really are you know we we felt the loss of your of 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 your of you know of your you you being gone this whole time. Once you come back, we kept your old desk warm and everything for you. Yep. And just see if he'll turn his back on all of his friends and money and power to to come back. You know. And for me, I, as I was saying, like even if they do runs against it, there is no repercussions from them. And the question lingers in the air: Why? Like they don't sack their home. Right. Their, their hideout. They never ch- like the the they go as far as the megacorp boundaries, and then regular stat police go after them or whatever. Right. But if it's another megacorp, they're all over them like cheap suit. Right. Oh, it asks it asks so many questions when you don't when you show restraint. Because is it their family holding things back and still keeping them safe? Are they a double agent? Yeah. And all your friends are like, why didn't they kill you? They should have killed you. Exactly. And it digs them to go break back in and ask that question. Yep. Yep. And you don't explain it. You you make them ask that question because it causes investment. Yep. Yep. And that in itself, that just putting a question mark in their mind Mm -hmm. and a target on them that says, what are you? Mm-hmm. to these people is enough to make that its own plot. Yep. And then you just let it grow. Yeah. Like a fungus. <laughs> <laughs> You're not sure what it's going to be, but in the end, it's going to be something hideous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and and you let those questions fester long enough, especially if you keep bringing the question up. Yeah. Um. Eventually, whether you – you don't even have to provide the answer for that. Your player will demand the answer and do something drastic to get that answer. Oh, God, yeah. 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 
And then, you know, like Maybe. I said, the whole time they're making choices. Yep. The whole time they're making choices. And the goal is not to get them to make any one particular no. choice, to go in any one particular nope. direction. The goal is make them ask these questions so that they have to make the choices, and that makes character development yes. happen. Yes, yes. That, that pushes the button of Cause, the question. Because now they're not just the hacker. They're the hacker that, you know, escaped from Renreku Technologies alive. Yeah. You know? How? How? Yeah. What is up with that? Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right. So we got a sci-fi one here. Uh, the character has always lived on the same planet and never had the opportunity to go to space. They uh, are a pretty good mechanic. One day, a damaged spacecraft lands on the planet, and they need some repairs. Luckily, the character is there to help the damaged ship. Once repaired, they have an opportunity to sneak on the spaceship and fly to somewhere unknown. Hmm. So, stowaway concept. Always lived in the same planet. Never had the opportunity to go to space. Okay, they're a good mechanic. A damaged spacecraft lands on the planet and needs some repair. The character is there to help. So... The, f the thing that kicks in my head on this one is ownership. They fixed this craft. And they are somebody... You 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 make the bond between them and the ship. Mm -hmm. It is their new home that takes them to where they want to go. Okay. And you okay. make that hard to hang on to. You make it challenging for them. Yeah, okay. Okay. I could see it. Um... Mm, the dichotomy I'm immediately seeing sure. is the comfort of home versus the unknown of space. I'm again easy. Um, and so yeah. you've got a person. Typically, like the the big, the big drama of I've always wanted the thing mm -hmm. is when you get the thing is does it match your expectations? Right. Does it come with extra baggage you didn't account for? Last Starfighter. Yeah. Um. Did you bite off more than you could chew? Yeah, you know, sort of thing. Is and... there things that you're you're protecting back home? Right, right, right. Did like... you do you do you think you want to get away, and then you realize you're you've set down more roots than you thought you did? Yeah, you know, um, are you willing to sever those roots to hang on to the newfound freedom and exploration you've got, or are you going to try to juggle the two of them, or or, or are those roots coming to find you, or are those roots coming to find you exactly? Yeah. Yeah, those are the kinds of things that always gets me is, is like, you, you put out there that, you know, they may not have left the planet, mm -hmm. but maybe someone saw them go. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, space police come asking, you know, they're just like, hey, we think you're, st we have a stowaway in the ship, right? Yeah. So, you know, it, are they going to get pulled back or is it just a conversation? Yeah. You know, kind of a thing. Or, or you know, maybe you're the head of a major trade company and you just up and disappear one day. <laughs> And then people ask questions. And then people start asking questions. Yeah. No, exactly. I, I, the, the roots one is a good one, definitely. Yeah, I, I just see like the Kaylee situation of Firefly, mm -hmm. where like this is mine, this is my child now. You know, don't talk badly to it, kind of a thing. Sure, but what? Wh where's the dichotomy though? The dichotomy um, is how do you pull that character in two directions at that point? So dichotomy with Kaylee is always the, uh, or at least with her, between her and the ship, is always having to leave the ship, being forced to have it be imparted things that she doesn't want because it's not hers to own. Mm -hmm. It's not hers to keep. It's going to have things happen to it. And to be there, she has to accept the adventures that it goes on. And that's where things get challenging. She can't say no when a firefight is happening on it. She can't say no when the people who are on it need her to do things. She is stuck there for every adventure, the good ones and the bad ones. Yeah, okay, okay. So it's a bit like a mother with a child then. You know, yeah. you have to accept that child's freedom and independence, but you also have to be a mother to that child. Right. And yeah. so for in that, it creates its own story around that child. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, you know, others may want to sell the ship, but no, no, this is mine. Mm -hmm. I I peed on it, you know. <laughs> this, this is now mine. I licked it. It's fine. <laughs> That's right. Literally, there's blood of mine in that engine component, you know. <laughs> so, uh, all right. The setting is a modern, almost or almost modern one. Uh, there's some element of horror to it. Okay. I'm leaning towards games like Call of Cthulhu, um, World cool. of Darkness, uh, Urban Shadow, City of Mist, that sort of thing. Sure. 
Okay, so contemporary fantasy. Sure. Um, Mr. Asher used to work for the state police, but one day he has seen a strange felony or murder hinting to the strangeness of the world. He could not stay in the police force. He had to know the truth is out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the weird key, uh, ex uh, uh, accident keeps haunting him in his dreams. He still has a family to take care. Uh, he could go and spend all of his resources on his hunt. As a former policeman, he opens a private eye agency, hoping to... Uh, Hoping his destiny, pushing his destiny, will let him uh, have a uh, have a job leading him to the strange shadow of the world. Okay, okay, okay I gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Um, so yeah, I, I I see a lot in this, but the biggest one I see is uh, spending all his resources and family. Mm -hmm. Like you want to know about the other world, and you still have to keep your family. You still want your family. Yeah, you can't. Can you keep? One foot in the normal world and one foot in the supernal. Yeah. And 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 play that play both sides of it. Yeah. How far will you go into the shadow to find out what lurks there? Mm-hmm. And what will you leave behind to do it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a very that's a very good one. That's yeah. a very good one. And and it's it is the constant question mm -hmm. that you're you're asking that person is you're gonna you'll take one more step? That takes you one step away. Mm -hmm. Like today, you have the choice. You can either go and investigate this poltergeist that you're very confident exists because you have, I don't know, some kind of direct evidence, mm -hmm. but it's fleeting. Or go to your daughter's recital tonight. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Your wife is angry that you've missed all of the all of the uh, the, the 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 dry runs prior to it, and she, you've never gone to one of her, you know, uh, one of the private sessions or her contests. And this one is actually going to be in the theater at home. It's easy to go to. This is the big break you've been looking for. Actual evidence of yep. supernatural activity right at your fingertips, and all you need to do. Is piss off your wife and disappoint your daughter. Yep. But it's yours. Yep. It's right it's there. Yours. It's right there. It's right, right there. there. Yep. Now, I'm not telling you which one's the right choice. Yep. There is no right choice. Mm -mm. But it's your choice to make. And whichever choice you make is going to define your character moving forward. Yeah. Very sitcom. Very sitcom. And that's good. Oh, yeah. Good, good, right, good writing in the sense the good questions should feel that way. What's going to happen? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Very, Don't know. Very straightforward. Don't know. And then, we're going to ask the question. It's and that choice. just and then it's did they take a step in that direction? Okay, if they took the step in that direction, maybe they went to the recital. Sure, something happens at the recital. Someone questions them. Maybe their phone's going off or whatever. Something bad happened in the other situation because they sent somebody. Mm -hmm. Now that person doesn't trust them nearly as much. Now it costs them to try and get more information. And and vice versa, because yeah. obviously you're going to, like I said, piss off your wife and, and disappoint yeah. your daughter. Meals are cold. Yep. You know. Yep. She's already asleep by the time you get home. Yep. Or worse yet, your wife's asleep, but your daughter's sitting up. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. All right. Overwatch. I love this. I read this one and I couldn't stop laughing. Oh, boy. The setting is Mech Warrior. <laughs> Mech Warrior Battle Tech. Blanche was a nerdy kid growing up and never really fell into a career. She has worked in various fields to pay the bills, often going from job to job and never really hitting her stride. She's middle-aged now, and her luck to date has been mostly terrible. That all changed when she won a famous annual contest sponsored by one of the largest industrial concerns as a PR stunt. Now, she finds herself in completely over her head, but she has finally found something she loves and is good at. Other people want what she has, and the only real use for it puts her in constant danger. She's starting to have second thoughts about her good fortune. Why, oh, why did she have to win that battle mech? <laughs> I love it. First off, what battle mech? Exactly. You know, that is a solid that is question. Question number one. What is, is she, what is she pilot? <laughs> that, is, that is a solid question. I tend to agree with you. Um, I, think, I think for me in this one is that she loves it. And she's good at it. Yeah. Right? So the question doesn't necessarily lean into does she stay a battle, a, a mech warrior, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's a given. That's a given. 
But the question is, does she go to war mm -hmm. or does she go to glory? Is it personal? Yeah, okay. Okay. Or is she doing it for a cause? Is 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 it duty is it duty or is it yeah, does she do it for others or does she do it for herself? Is it is it her personal glory or is it her duty to whoever she's with? I or... mean, it's not that much unlike the previous one. Yeah. In in a lot of ways. And again, it's that it's that simple dichotomy of of are you doing this because you have a personal gain that you want to keep going, that that internal drive? Or are you willing to set that to the side for something else? Not necessarily greater, but something else. I'm I'm kind of reaching back a little bit to the same sort of dichotomy we had with the uh, the mafia woman. Yeah. Okay. Um. And so we've got a question here of like, okay, you you're a, you're a middle aged woman mm -hmm. who's never really amounted to much until you sat in that battle mech and yeah. then find out that that you're. That being a mech jock is what, you know, what you were meant to do. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing. Like, you're never too young to find your purpose in life. No. But as a middle-aged woman, you've got a lot of preconceived notions built up about how the world works. Mm -hmm. You are no longer bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. You are, you're kind of set in your ways at yeah. this point. What preconceived notions are you bringing out into the greater galaxy with you? As you ride around in that mech now and fight in whatever skirmishes it, it takes you to, you know, right. um, say you join up with a mech, mech unit, you know, are you going to, or a, like a mercenary unit, are you going to agree with, you know, the contracts they take? Are you going to agree with their, with their methods? Are you just a, you know, good old grassroots girl next door who mm -hmm. just wants to pilot a big stompy robot and maybe shoot some pew pew lasers at people? And, oh God, the horrors of war are now a reality. Right. People are dead. Yeah. You know? Or, and, and this is for me on the same side of that, is like, if she goes through the arena kind of thing, like maybe Solaris it's a, 7. So yeah, Solaris yeah. 7 kind of thing, where maybe it's small unit fighting sure. in Solaris, which is totally a thing, yep. you know? You know, she starts seeing, she sees all these young people, you know, who have dreams and aspirations and are good, but she's just better. And she's wrecking them. Mm -hmm. Like, they're angry at her, but in truth, it's all fear. This is all they have. She had a life before this. You know? Mm -hmm. She had a family, maybe. Mm -hmm. Like, you had jobs, career, things you did. This is all these people know. And you literally just kicked them out of this whole championship with, like, two shots and a little torso twisting. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Are you going to gloat over that? Because they, they wanted to rub it in your face that they were going to get you? Yeah. You know, kind of a thing? How do you, how do you reconcile your, you know... Your your newfound uh, uh, expertise, I suppose, yeah. with honestly your civility towards your fe your fellow man. You yeah, know? yeah, no, yeah. it's that's... there's a lot of little things there you could go to. Yeah, there's a lot of little things in there, and what I think what I like most about this one is that it's it's subtle. Yeah, you know, like you're still doing the thing. Yeah, whatever it is, you know, this isn't you're still a mech warrior. You're mm -hmm. like not nothing's going to change that. It's really all about the emotional baggage you carry with you into the situations. You mm -hmm. know, how does your past influence your future? Mm -hmm. So yep. that's a that's a common one that keeps coming up. It does. That's an easy dichotomy to reach for. Is how does your past influence your future? Yeah, and it's it, it's also not something that says good or evil. Yeah, at all. Yeah, you're not you're not setting that because that, sometimes that feels like a cop out. That's that that can be walked around or tiptoed. Well, this really isn't evil, and it's, none of that matters. Well, you know, I mean, like, I, I think a lot of us get that from video games, though. Oh, one hundred percent. I mean, like, look look at Mass Effect. Oh God, you yeah. know, I, it, are you going to do the Paragon thing or are you going to do the Renegade thing? Well, no, I'm going to punch the Krogan. Oh, you punched somebody. That was evil. No, a he's Krogan. a Krogan. That's all he respects. That's how they talk. Yeah. If somebody doesn't get punched, nothing got worked out. You know. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. They don't, they don't decide on pizza toppings unless somebody has a black eye over it. Yep, that's true. That's you know, true. so yes, I punched the Krogan. I should get Paragon points for that. <laughs> I, I always go back to Riker on the uh, Klingon Bird of Prey mm -hmm. as the second. Like, you're going to listen to me now after kicking the one guy butt right, right in front of the commander. Exactly. And the and Klingons are like, oh, w no, well, well, played. well played. Good. No, hey, no, you're you're good. Yeah. You, you technically could have killed him if you wanted to, and we wouldn't even question it. It's, you know? it's your right. He, you, know. you, you bested him in combat. Absolutely. No, no. Do you want to? Do you I want don't... to I've got a bat left. Like, you want to? Okay. Like, okay. No, I respect that. It's, it's like, no, I because I don't want to do his job. <laughs> 
if he's dead now, I've got to do my job and his. Best answer. I mean, that's that's the truth. So. Best answer. Yeah. But yeah, no, like don't don't like that's. But I think it's great advice. Don't don't immediately reach for the what's the good option and what's the bad option because yeah. you know find two neutral options. You really genuinely don't want to be to have to care. Which one they choose. Not at all. The important part is making them make a choice which leads to character development. And then later on, show them that choice when they want to possibly unmake it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> or so, have. So, sometimes, sometimes the next thing is showing them just how many times they've chosen A over B or B mm-hmm. over A. Mm-hmm. And just have a character, you know, have, a, have an NPC later on go, wow, you've been really leaning into that B choice, haven't you? And have them go, what, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this, yeah. and when this came up, you immediately reached for that. Like, yeah. oh, oh, I'm that guy, aren't I? Yes, you are. Yeah. You've I always s- been that guy. Immediately go to Blanche, you know, walking through a city, and they're like, you know, it's a parade, you know, with her, her unit, right? And she's, you know, the mech's walking on its own. It's in auto mode, and she's like, you know, waving, and then she sees the digital billboard on one of the buildings that shows the battle of her just gunning down troops and vehicles and it's all superposed of like her and then a, something blowing up and then her and then her mech and then something blew it up and she's like oh my god i'm the killer here yeah like and they're all cheering for her like you saved our planet yay no i i just murdered 45 mech warriors and 150 troops yeah of an of an accounting force and like and, and boss is just like because it was your contract mm-hmm. you did your duty that makes you a good mech warrior. Yeah. Yeah. One of the best. See? There you go. Yep. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Love it. Yep. Got all it. Right. I love this stuff. All right. You want to go first to me? I haven't I haven't read yours. I see I see that it is there on the show sheet. My eyes have done naught but sk- like skim that it is there. I would say go ahead. All right. Read it off. So Rob's character. Setting is modern post mass outbreak rebirth and rebuild. Okay, so we're we are after so we're like division two. Keep reading. We're we're like we're like division two. Is <laughs> yes, that right? Yes. Okay, a, okay. A little bit after, actually. If you if you keep. Okay, push push a little further. Major yeah. contagion was released, killing millions. It's been five years, and parts of society are rebuilding, like post division. Okay, yes. cool. Yep. yep. Um, Melody was an unsanctioned operative for the CIA. She sustained uh, in private after serving in several conflicts for the Army and Special Forces. Skilled in close combat and surveillance, she, uh, she expected and wanted to return to action, but the alert never came through. She has lived in the local area since her return as an injured vet, being honored by local patriots and tending to a small farm with her dog. She watched most of the larger cities get wiped out, and helped with keeping people sane as a good leader when others came to loot her little slice of life. She wants to know what happened to her friends in the forces and the truth behind the attacks, but with media all gone and so many half-truths, it's hard to tell who's on what side. There you go. So the immediate dichotomy I'm seeing is this woman has in an absolutely awful situation in an apocalypse brought on you know you know that, that didn't necessarily ruin you know ruin the planet but it wiped out millions mm-hmm. okay so much death and destruction and she in the end of this five years later has a little farm the dog mm-hmm. she's found peace mm-hmm. she can finally have peace mm-hmm. after all that destruction but that call to adventure is still there for her. Mm-hmm. She has that lingering curiosity of the, uh, the loose ends, mm-hmm. you know, of what what did happen to her family and friends. You know, she, she, and also the unmet expectations. Yeah, you said she kept expecting to get called back out. She wants to go back out, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but she just didn't. Yeah. And that farm got an extra crop plot, mm-hmm. and the dog got a year older. Mm-hmm. Maybe the dog had puppies. Now nah, she's got four or five dogs. Yeah. Maybe some of the locals count on her for her corn harvest. Sure. But she's still got that P90 sitting in that box by her bed. Yeah. There's still there's still the two crates underneath the the uh, yep the old barn. One one with her sniper turret. One with her secret mines. <laughs> yep. 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 <laughs> 
She's got all the equipment she needs. Her little striker drone. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just, mm, it's all out there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's easy, but I, but. <sighs> What's the hidden dichotomy? Well. What's the question to ask? It's a choice between comfort, boring comfort versus dynamic uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Um, the question is, that's a good character origin, but how do you sustain that throughout the story to shape the character? Yeah. And so I expect as a storyteller what I would do with this is... Um, I would show her reflections of herself. Okay. So we would come across another, um, another, another settlement. Yeah. Where we're like, uh, there, there is another retired agent who, who made the choice she didn't. Cause obviously she stays on the farm. We know she didn't choose to stay on the farm because then the adventure wouldn't happen. Unless we're playing Stardew Valley, the, uh, the role playing game. Right. You know? And we want a really weird backstory for our farmer. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> um, so obviously we're we're playing we're we're playing as as division agents or Correct. whatever whatever we are in this in this in this sure. world here. Um, so we we have to show we have to show her the choice that she could have made. We have mm-hmm. to show her what that looks like, and we have that other agent talk to her about her regrets in having chosen that, mm-hmm. or or the things she gained. In choosing that so that she can – we can ask that question to her again. Did you make the right choice? You know? Right. Maybe this other agent is perfectly happy. Mm-hmm. And maybe doesn't go as far as saying, I can't believe you chose to go back out. Yeah. But that's the only thing that isn't said, you yeah. know? And you leave you leave this person thinking like, okay, no, come on. I, mm, I could have had a farm with some dogs and some corn. That would have been nice. Yeah, it would have been nice. It would have been peaceful, but instead I'm out here shooting people, you know? Yeah. But then, you know, you've got to show her also that value of, like, you know, have people, like, say to her things like, hey, you know, thank God you chose to come off that farm, you know, and come back into action. We can really use you right about now. I mean, imagine where we'd be if you were still shucking corn. Yeah. Or the other part of it that always got me was the mirror or the uh, the reflection of yourself doing something that everyone around you has never seen. Mhm. Like you're just a farmer. You're Melody Farmer, right? You're on Melody Farms. Mhm. And then the next moment is you wh- whipping out a P90 and throwing a drone up in the air and commanding and ordering, you know, you're Superman effectively or Superwoman in this yeah. case, and like they're scared. They don't understand this. You're one of them. You were one of us. You you helped here on the farm. You tilled my fields. I didn't know you were capable of murder. Exactly. Yep. Wait, unquestionable. Well, I didn't murder them. This was enemy combatants. They were armed. They were going to kill us. That's... I know. Yeah. But you killed them. Right. And I looked into your eyes as you did it, and there was nothing there. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't yeah. feel anything when you killed them. Oh. Oh, I see why you think I'm like them now. Yeah. You know? Everybody's a little more scared now. Yep. Because you made that decision. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's those kind of things. All, All right. right. What you got for me? Okay. So, uh, fantasy setting. Fantasy setting. Fantasy setting. Um, the uh, the character's name is Tylora. Um, Tylora was uh, born in a small village uh, on the outskirts of society. It still kind of has a bit of a superstitious, um, you know, they, they have a village wise woman, okay. essentially. Okay. 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 Um, was, Hearth knowledge. Was it. born Tyler. Um, at an early age, realized that they were transgender okay. and that um, they needed to do something about that. Sure. They were taken to the village wise woman. The village wise woman gave Tylora two things that day. Mm-hmm. One was the magics that would uh, set her gender right for her. Okay. But also was informed that the um, the position of wise woman, mm-hmm. of, of wise person, I should mm-hmm. say. Right. That's a position. Um, gotcha. Is uh, it is seen as sacred to be transgender? Oh, um, because you are able to see things from both a male and female perspective. Oh, interesting. And it lends you the ability to essentially straddle that line and be the great mediator between between disputes. Okay. Okay. You walk two worlds. Okay. Um, however, uh, no, no. This is this is good. This is you know, uh, 
Ty- Tylor is overjoyed to hear this. Sure. But uh, then is told that to officially become the next wise woman for the uh, for the village, they now need to go out on a journey mm-hmm. um, of at least a year and a day. Okay. And they need to find some great truth from out in the world and bring it home. Okay. That's your setup. So they're... So one of the things that that this like, as I was listening to this, I was trying to filter through the things that are personal mm-hmm. and personal choices that could be made that probably don't even need to be plot related that are that could be whimmed mm-hmm. effectively. Sure. But the one thing that I heard was they're interested in becoming the wise person. Mm-hmm. To do this, they need to set on a journey. So that that's their drive. Correct. The first thing I say is, do you really want to go home after you've seen all of this? Yeah. Yeah, I think like, that's, I think that's, that's a pretty obvious one. Yeah. You know, how far away are you willing to walk, and are you willing to cross a bridge that will collapse behind you? Mm-hmm. You know, and that when I say collapse behind you, that could be any number of things. You're burning a bridge. You're letting it fall. You're not choosing to return. You know, all of it. Well, I could always go back. Of course, you could. You could always go back. And they'd be happy to have you. They'd be overjoyed to have you. Yeah. You're sacred in their in their culture. Yeah, but isn't that tasty? Mm-hmm. You know, that that kind of thing. You know, t- try the strawberries, you know. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, one thing, actually, is, is, is we're kind of hashing this out, and believe it or not, this didn't occur to me earlier. Um, are you uh, familiar with the story of Siddhartha? Yes. I know uh, the good earth. It's uh, it's essentially Govinda. Yo, yo, very or, much no, so. No, 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 I'm sorry. It is, it, is, it is Siddhartha. It's Siddhartha. It's, yeah. yeah. It's actually Siddhartha, yeah. Yeah. Um, but in that in that same regard, I also see opportunities bringing itself to a point to make a decision, one way or another within that. So the bridge is not also the distance they're going mm-hmm. in the adventure, but who they're choosing to be. Like, are they attaching themselves to other people? Yeah, yeah. Are those people a not willing to return back with them, or if they do, it's making them choose a certain life? Yeah. Somewhere out there, especially a year and a day of of experience, minimum yeah, of experience, minimum. Yeah. you have to you have to build some relationships out there. Yep, and you never know what you're going to find, mm-hmm. whether it be love, romance, revenge. Mm-hmm. All of that is easily found and will easily keep you from home. Yeah, exactly. So. I realize actually I should probably di- – you're familiar with Govinda, but our listeners may, may not yeah, that is true. Siddhartha, that is true. but it may, yeah. may not be. Uh, Open a book. No. The, the, the story of Siddhartha and Govinda um, is uh, uh, two Buddhist monks – if I'm remembering correctly, this is going to be a very cliff notes and poorly remembered version of this. Yeah. So for, forgive any inaccuracies here, but essentially it's it's the story of the prodigal son. You've got um, two Buddhist monks basically uh, that are both seeking enlightenment. Um, Govinda stays behind and is a good monk and meditates every day and follows all the precepts of the Buddha and stuff like that. Whereas Siddhartha goes out into the world and takes part in all of the taboo things, experiences, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all that jazz. Yes, Um, yes. And uh, uh, lives this vagabond life and eventually comes back to uh, to the monastery and has found enlightenment. Um, and Govinda is incensed about this because he's mm-hmm. like, I was, <laughs> I did the monk thing by the book every single day. You went up and whined and dined and, you know, cavorted and frolicked and any yeah. other euphemism I can have for, you know, for, for raucous behavior. And, uh, you co- and you're the one that gets enlightenment. This just isn't fair. Mm-hmm. You know? And then I think Siddhartha kisses him on the forehead and it passes his enlightenment to Govinda, and he experiences the visions and, he's, and, the, and he, the timelessness. He sees, yeah. he sees that experiencing the world gives you a well-rounded uh, view of, yes. of things, yes. and such like that. And because he was also a monk, but also has the experience of the outside world, he reaches enlightenment. Yes, he reaches his own. Yep, he becomes a becomes a whole person. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's that sort of prodigal son of like if you leave and you experience all these things in the world, what will you bring back with you, and will it be good or bad? Do you return though? Is often the question. Yeah. There, there are many. There are the the, the return is always a thing. Rum Springer. Yeah, you but you never return the same, and yep. for that sometimes you leave again quickly. Mm-hmm. I mean, Lord of the Rings showed that. You know, the, though the hobbits return, or though the you know um, Frodo returned, he couldn't. Yeah. 
He really couldn't stay. Or, conversely, you get, like, Fallout 1's ending. Yeah. Thank you, Wanderer, for saving our for saving our vault. We couldn't have done it without you. All of us owe you our lives. And for that reason, you can't stay here. Right. You belong to the Wasteland now, and if you stayed here, you would disrupt the entire social structure of everything. So I have to ask you to leave. Yeah. Goodbye. Here, Here's everything you need. Here's everything you need, but get out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. With our gratitude, never return. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's... It's crazy, but mm-hmm. it's, it's it, those kind of stories are are compelling as hell. Yep, you know. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, okay, well, I mean, those kind of were our Discord questions that we yeah worked on. Um, I know we have a handful regarding Brindlewood Bay. Yeah, I'm um, I'm, I'm excited for uh for next week. Yeah, this is a spotlight. Too excited actually last week to say that we were going to do it this week. Um, <laughs> that but... was the that was and I I said it was going to happen. You did. I you said did, it was and going I to happen. It. The I... last episode of my of May got pushed into the first week of June, and, and all of us started re- regarding it as the first show of June. Yep, and it messed me right up. Yep, it messed me right up. But Brindlewood Bay is a lot of fun. It I murder I... she wrote the RPG. I'm... With some elements that I did not expect. Did you look at it at all? I, I haven't. I, I Work will, hit me and hit me hard. So. I will let you have the excitement. I started reading through it, and uh, literally in the first few pages, you're going to be like, oh? Okay. And, and so there's some twists in it, but it's very, very well done. I think it's I think it's wonderful, and it's different in a lot of ways. Okay. Uh, okay. So it'll be fun. It'll be fun to go through the whole thing, and uh, we'd love to have you guys with us uh, and join us in that journey, so please do so. Uh, again, questions are still going to be open all the way through uh, next week, so if you want to add some more questions for us, we'd love to have them. And, hey, as a last message also, happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride, everybody. All right, you can find us on Twitter at st underscore conclave, on Instagram at st underscore conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time on mixlr.com slash storyteller dash conclave. And join us up on our Discord. We'd love to uh, hear from you, throw us some questions. We'd love to answer them here on the air. Um, Bounce some questions off the other storytellers that are there in the community. Uh, We'd absolutely love to have you. You can find that link on our Twitter as well as our website, storytellerconclave.com. We'd like to thank our Patreon members who assist us every month, especially our named members, Knox in the Box, Subject Sam, The Arcane Asylum, Sparkle Motion, Veteran, Hulavu, and Sean. We truly appreciate your support. Our pre-show music is by Arcane Anthems. You can find them at patreon.com slash arcane anthems. Our intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. You can find them at geefrog.bandcamp.com or on Google Music. or now on YouTube starting to produce some extra stuff. Um, our outro music is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Miriam Machine. You can find them at freemusicarchive.org. And a uh, big shout out as always to our families, Vicky and Sean. Thank, Thank you so you. much for loving and supporting you. us. All of our friends have sat at our tables over these years to give you these great stories to share with you and you, every single one of our listeners. We love you guys so much. Love you. Good night. Good night.